efficiency aside, reducing the mains capacity of a CO2 system is a big headline thing to do. And we've won jobs on, on the back of being able to do that. Welcome everyone to another CO2 Monday with Trevor and the Refrigeration Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and I have a special guest today. Uh, actually, I only met a few weeks ago through a, a acquaintance of mine, James Bailey, and James was like, was like, you got to try to get Daniel on, on your uh, CO2 Mondays because he is really knowledgeable in CO2, one of the first guys to learn about CO2 uh, in the UK, and I want to learn more about this. We're going to talk about the evolutions of CO2. We're going to get into the knowledge of Daniel Clark, and we're going to talk more on CO2. Daniel, welcome to the CO2 Monday show. How are you doing? I'm good, Trevor. Yeah, thank you. So let's just start off and let the audience know a little bit about Daniel Clark and your company, uh, Incentra. Did I pronounce that right? Icentra, yeah. Icentra. It comes from Icentropic, the word Icentropic. It's yeah. a little play on words. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So how do you get into the industry? How do you get into the CO2 and, and what made you... Uh, uh, you know, get into this uh, business of CO2 refrigeration? Yeah, well, um, I come from a farming background uh, in the UK um, for, from uh, many generations of farming. And um, uh, a long story short, my uh, mother and father decided to uh, sell a farm, uh, you know, 30 years ago now, or whatever it was, 28 years ago. And um, I thought, well, what am I going to do? I'd always envisaged being a farmer. And uh, I said to my dad, well, what am I going to do now? And he said, well, looking at these bills for, and invoices for fixing all the fridges on the farm, I, I think you should get into the uh, refrigeration game. Wow. And I thought, well, it's, it always interested me how, uh, how fridges worked and all the heat and the cold. And, you know, I didn't have a clue, but it always, it always when I was a child, it always kind of um, being around refrigeration kit, it always kind of... Um, you know, I was, I was always thinking, how does it work? So I thought, well, that's a great idea. So um, I kind of uh, decided to go to university and learn about refrigeration. First day at uni, I knew nothing about refrigeration. And um, I kind of did really well at it. I uh, spent three years uh, at uh, university, you know, got a distinction in thermodynamics and did, did quite well, really. Um, and then... Um, I got a job um, uh, almost as an apprentice, although I was in my early to mid 20s. Uh, I got a job as an apprentice working on installing supermarkets, um, just uh, rack systems, pack systems uh, for in the retail environment for, you know, the Tesco's and the Morrison's and the Sainsbury's of the UK world. And, uh, and then after kind of only 18 months, two years, I moved up into the design office because obviously I, I had my qualifications. And, but I, coming from a practical farming background, I thought it was important to get a hands-on kind of uh, role first. So I really kind of, you know, was brazing pipes, welding, uh, chopping, you know, chopping the steel up and putting the bracketry up and commissioning. Um, so uh, then I went to the design office. I had about three years in the design office uh, doing CAD drawings, pipe sizing, sizing compressors, uh, designing control systems. And then uh, in 2004, I set up a consultancy practice called Hamilton Clark. And um, we, we did um, just that really, uh, carried on designing um, refrigeration systems for the retail world. Um, but I quickly, uh, I went out to Germany to a trade show. Back then it was called IKK. And um, there was this one refrigeration uh, rack there, I suppose, yeah. It was a big, a big piece of plant. It was very strange. There was people all over it. And, it, and I thought I was clever, you know. And um, I couldn't understand what was going on. Um, and I don't think anybody could. And all the signs were in Danish and there was no English speakers there. So I went away from the show and kind of made it my business to find out what it was. And, um, and that meant, um, I obviously knew it was CO2 and it, that it was early days, but I thought, wow, this is going to be the future because HFCs, 
and C, uh, C, uh, CFCs and HCFCs were all, you know, even back then they were frowned upon. Um, so I went out to uh, Denmark with about, uh, there was only, there was less than 10 of us from the UK. Um, a lady called Jane Garshaw from Cool Concerns organized a trip and um, yeah, there was, there was probably six, somewhere between six or eight of us. And we went out to the Danish Technology Institute in Aarhus in, in, uh, in Denmark. And there was a couple of chaps there called uh, Torben and Kim who went on to founder Advancer. But uh, back in the day, they were just working at the DTI as researchers, as, as I remember. And there were some other good names working there that are now at Danfoss, quite senior names at Danfoss now that are working at the DTI. So we learned, uh, we learned all about CO2 in its kind of raw format. There was a lot of, com you know, the compressors were a bit, uh, you know, they, they weren't very sophisticated. None of the control gear was very, it was all, it was all kind of research and development back then. Yeah. And um, long story short, within, well, I'd say within four years, because um, we were consulting, obviously, uh, we'd done our first project with Carrier and uh, the Cool Tech um, system, which I think they inherited from Lindy. They might not thank me for pointing that out, but ultimately, uh, Lindy in Germany had spent a, a huge amount of uh, time and research and development on developing CO2 along, well, I won't say alongside the DTI, but kind of like in parallel with the DTI, they were one of the first movers. Uh, so we'd, uh, we'd worked with uh, Carrier in the early days on, on CO2 and, and did a few installations from, say, 2011. And, uh, and then I was, uh, we, we, uh, I was asked to talk at the Consumer Goods Forum, the Global Consumer Goods Forum in 2012 or 13, which Tesco hosted, but it was a global event. There was, um, you know, directors from the retail world, you know, globally, South Africa, America, Canada, Australia. You know, it was a really big event. Uh, I, and just before I spoke, um, the, uh, the Minister for Climate Change and Environment, the UK Government Minister, spoke before I did. Wow. So I had a bit of a nerve wracking. I had to follow, follow him. But it was a brilliant event. And we kind of showcased CO2 as a refrigerant, uh, doors on retail fridges, heat recovery, all sorts of best practices. Uh, and that's how it was built. It was built, you know, this is, this is the best practice in retail refrigeration. So we got very good at consulting. Um, and then I thought, well, is consulting the best, you know, the best business case, the best route for our skills? Because it's not just me in the business. I've got a technical director who works for our centre. He's been with me since 2007. And he's, you know, he's very, very good with CO2, to say the least, as well. And um, we thought, well, maybe it's not the best route for our, you know, consulting. It's, it's always a difficult sell, uh, difficult to leverage the value. Um, so we thought we're going to productize our knowledge. And that's where our iCentra came from, productizing our knowledge. Um, <clears throat> but we thought, you know, ultimately, we, we decided that the retail environment, I wouldn't say we've saturated, but it's, it's, it's a very competitive environment. And I knew that there's two opportunities for iCentra. That was taking CO2 knowledge into the industrial sector to, com well, to fit against ammonia. I don't, I don't like saying compete because there's clear advantages for ammonia. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're not here to, you know, we know that ammonia is a fantastic refrigerant um, and we aspire to build ammonia products in the future. But <clears throat> we took iCentra into the industrial sector, effectively non-retail. Um, so we've done some really good projects, building some really big CO2 plant for, for industrial. And then we've also moving quite successfully into the world of transcritical heat pumps and heating water with the big decarbonisation of heat agenda that we've got in the UK and Europe. It's really picking up a lot of speed now. It's, it's literally, it's just at a tipping point. You know, we're seeing some fantastic inquiries come through for CO2 technology in large scale heat pumps.
Yeah, I love that. And I see that happening globally. Something you said earlier that I really liked is that back in 2004, when you went to that event, you were curious. And this is what everyone on here should be more of, if you're not already, be curious of CO2. Because as you said, you see it growing immensely already. And it's been growing since the early 2000s when you first started. Slow starter, but now I see it excelling especially in the, the heat pump, electrification, decarbonization, all this stuff. And that really excites me and you're involved with it and you're seeing more projects happening. So it makes me really excited about that. So your company now is involved on uh, industrial plants, more on the larger commercial industrial plants on the heat pump side or both the refrigeration and heat pump side? Both. So we're, we're, we're kind of tailoring our centre to large capacity CO2 plant. So a small system, I don't know what it uh, equates to in BTUs, but we're kind of, we probably wouldn't look at a job less than 200 kilowatts. Um, and then right through to, you know, uh, one and a half, even up to two megawatts, uh, you know, on, on CO2 plant. So that, that's where we're kind of pitching the iCentra offer. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're going to specialize, uh, which is great for heat networks, so uh, the, the UK is forecasted to 20% to of heat will be developed within heat networks. So 20% of heat in new buildings will come from heat networks. And that's kind of the market we, you know, we're, we're kind of going to be aiming for. That is, that is awesome. Because once again, I was down at uh, Atmosphere America in June and a friend of mine, um, Benoit from a company called Simco, he was talking about a project they did in Edmonton, Alberta here about a heat network. And we're, you're going to, he said, we're going to continue to see that grow here, even in Canada. So I expect globally, that's going to happen more and more. Um, yeah. One thing I want to ask you, and we'll go back, go back. I'm a little over all over the place, but so you went to DTI, is that correct? In Denmark? Yeah. And what, how did, First of all, how did you figure out that they were doing CO2 first? Maybe they were at that show. And what are some of the things that you got out of that uh, training or education or that, those sessions that made you more curious to get into CO2? Yeah, I mean, I can't remember exactly how it went. But <laughs> I obviously went to this Germany, uh, the trade show in Germany, saw this CO2 plant. And, uh, you know, it didn't happen overnight, but, you know, I've, I've obviously got a few kind of contacts in the industry. And um, I don't know how, I, I think it might have just been advertised in the trade press or something back then. And, and Jane Garshaw and uh, Steve Benton for Cool Concerns were running this, you know, trip to out to the DTI. And I think we all flew out together. And um, yeah, Jane had put together a really thick brochure that she'd obviously worked with the DTI on, on and Danfoss on, you know, triple points and all like the, the, the basic CO2 knowledge and the foundation and how, you know, how, explaining about transcritical. And I just thought, wow, this is a brilliant kind of world to get into. It's got to be the future. And um I just I just kind of ran with it and and um, and really enjoyed learning about it and I think now it's easier to learn about it because there's so much more information out there and in Europe there's been so much product development you know on hardware and software you've got big controls manufacturers that have got a lot of information on how how you control a CO2 plant and then obviously all the compressor manufacturers are really kind of um, refining their ranges and um and then obviously Danfoss and Corel and Emerson uh, they've all really kind of bringing out hardware and scaling up the manufacture of that hardware and making it more uh, consumer friendly uh, and supporting it with the literature so there's a lot you know for people that want to learn about CO2 there's a huge amount of information out there uh, for the, but you've got ultimately it's quite I wouldn't say it's it is a small step change on HFCs. There's no doubt about it. We can narrow it down to um, just how the, uh, the gas cooler or the condenser, how that works, and the receiver pressure, how that works, and the relationship between the gas cooler and the receiver. Well, then everything else downstream, 
uh, in terms of liquid line, evaporators, suction lines, the compressors, superheat, you know, uh, oil recovery. There's a huge amount of kind of synergies. In fact, there's a, an immense amount of synergies with the HFC and the pneumonia plant. It's only really when you get into the gas cooler and the and the liquid receiver that you know that the, the differences are kind of there to be investigated really and and learnt about. Yeah, we're in good climate zones where you're not in transcritical that often. This summer's a little exceptional, but here in Canada, where you're limited to the amount of hours that you're even in transcritical if you wanted it to be besides if you're doing heat reclaim and things like that or using heat recovery, but uh, yeah. we're in great climate zones for CO2 transcritical uh, systems. Um, from what it sounds like, your company, you guys manufacture this equipment. It's not, it doesn't sound like it's cookie cutter stuff. You build uh, custom units for your customer, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one, of the, one of the ones that we shipped last week was 280 kilowatts at minus 40 degrees celsius so i know that might not translate well into uh, uh, you know into a tangible uh, btus and uh, and fahrenheit but ultimately it's a very sizable piece of co2 plant um we're building it on a really big format uh, chassis 2.4 meters wide so that's kind of eight yeah. foot um you know it's a big it's big it's big kit and um we're hoping to be you know get a name for and it's and it's our expert CO two knowledge that allows us mm -hmm. to 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 have the confidence and the ability to build those kind of big big projects, big number, you know, plant machinery, and then and then there's another kind of uh, step change to translate that into a heat pump technology. Um, so, so so that so that that's the question that I do have like because I see a lot of manufacturers they will do um, they'll either do like just say the the package booster system and or they'll do chillers or they'll do heat pumps you do kind of all of it you know yeah, we're more bespoke so if there's a if there's more specialized project that needs that's not just off the shelf that's that's what we can do I love it so in the early days you guys had you know, 10, eight, 10 years of experience with CO2, you were doing consulting. Um, then you then you started this manufacturing business in the early days. So I guess this is 2013 uh, around 2012, 2013, 2014. What were some of the, the challenges at that time compared to today um, with developing and manufacturing CO2 equipment? Yeah, I think it was it was componentry and compressors mainly valves and getting pressure ratings for for every component in the system even pipe work and fittings um hoses you name it there were challenges there in in getting the 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 hardware to maintain to keep the pressures where they need to be and and to deal with the pressures so i remember you know the, the lindy stroke carrier cool tech system um, the first ones, uh, I think it was the Sainsbury's in London near in Greenwich, um, which uh, is near um, what what we called uh, the Millennium Dome when it was first built, or it's now called the Old Two Arena. Um, that that had a, a very early uh, Lindy Cooltech um, CO two plant and the high pressure valve, the gas cooler outlet valve. Um, nobody did one. Nobody made one that was, you know, specific for CO2. And that had a, a massive valve that was probably way oversized, but it, it was from the oil and gas industry. And, um, and that, ha that, that had just been tailored to suit a CO2 system or, or wedged in to, to, the, to the project to make it do what it needed to do. And then Danfoss developed the ICAB valve and the IC, ITCMS valve and, you know, uh, it, it start, slowly started to evolve, but everything from transducers to you know uh, controllers, it was it was it was pretty raw and and challenging to um, and and borrowing a lot of kind of technology and hardware from other industries. Yeah, and I, and I've heard that too. I've talked to many other manufacturers that in the early days it was a struggle to figure out how to get these components to work at these, you know, higher pressures and comply with 
regulations that aren't really even there at that point. When you're building this equipment, now I start to see more and more regulation coming in because CO2 is becoming more prominent. But back 10, 15, 20 years ago, there wasn't really any codes uh, for CO2 that I seen, you know, going in through. So now at least they're starting to understand manufacturers are starting to build, like you said, more compressors, more components, more um, piping that will uh, work with CO2. So, that, so that's re what's really exciting for me. And technology continues to grow. I'd love to hear a little bit about your heat pump technology and what differentiates you maybe from some of the other manufacturers out there uh, for the industrial plants. Um, I think um, I don't, I don't, you know, there are other heat pump manufacturers out there. Uh, and, and at the moment, um, you know, there isn't going to be enough heat pump manufacturers to meet demand, you know, so yes, there are competitors out in the marketplace, but, you know, I think it's going to be a, a big marketplace to go at. And um, where, where, we're, where we're concentrating is, is on the larger end of the market. You know, that's where we come from in terms of refrigeration. And, you know, we've, we've, we've done a project and we've got a couple more in the pipeline for large number CO2 projects. Um, and that's, that's just where we're going to carry on uh, aiming our core business is on industrial refrigeration and uh, large scale heat pumps. Um, maybe not quite high volume stuff, but certainly more specialized you know we want to we want to be um you know looking for specialist projects and and, mm -hmm. and get involved on a more specialized side um, yeah no and, that, and that's that's great to, to know because i totally agree with you i've talked with people all around the globe and there's not going to be enough manufacturers for co2 equipment first of all and not having enough people that have that knowledge of CO2 to, to really get that head start, which I love to see that you have, have that head start and, and you're there out, out there doing it. What are some of the differences you see from, say, technicians working on your equipment? And you, maybe you have a service team, but difference in, in 20, say, 2014, 2015 to uh, 2022. Is there a difference in the knowledge that you feel like, more people are starting to grasp CO2 when they're servicing your equipment, installing your equipment, or do you feel like it's still like a struggle to get qualified people to work on your equipment? I think um, it's more, it, it's more of, I, I see a lot of uh, engineers and commissioning engineers and service engineers, as they start to work with CO2, they might be a bit apprehensive at first, but, um, you know, particularly the, the younger engineers, they really, really want to learn about it and, and are really inquisitive and want to learn. And, and that's what it takes. It's just, it's just having the confidence to gain the experience. And then once you realize that it's not, you know, massively different, you know, as I explained, you've got the two, two, you know, fairly big differences in the gas cooler and the receiver. Once, once those, once people understand that, um, then they can run with it. And, um, you know, it, it's more about um, confidence than, than anything else uh, and making sure that the resources are there. So where we kind of really concentrate is customer service. So uh, we support our customers massively with, uh, with training and, you know, phone calls and, yeah, right, got this problem, this is what you need to do and really kind of guiding them through it. And um, we've worked with some fantastic engineers that have, are really gaining in confidence and knowledge. And, and, and it's all about, it is all about confidence. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that because a lot of the technicians I train on CO2, they know it, you know, you got to teach them those few differences, like you said. Um, but after you start showing them and talking to them, they're like, this is just refrigeration. I've been working on this all my life. Yeah, you have been. It is just yeah. refrigeration. It's just to get over that hurdle because a lot of people, I believe, put a lot of fear into their, oh, it's high pressures, it's dangerous. No, there's way more higher pressure probably in my, my car and hydraulics or in a, a skid pump. I always do that reference. You know, you ever use a skid pump and move a cart around? Uh, there's probably 5,000, yeah, yeah. 10,000 PSI in that hydraulic line compared to what's in a CO2 system and it's right beside yeah. you. 
I mean, the pressures are kind of, I describe them as the new normal. You know, they, they are high, but that's what the componentry is designed for it. Uh, you have got to be more careful. I mean, I, I used to use the hydraulic kind of analogy, but it, it, isn't, it isn't quite as simple as that, to be honest with you, because uh, when you've got a, a gas, it's not a pressure in liquid or an IE in oil. Um, when you let the pressure go, you get very little expansion. So, you know, you, you don't get much of a bang, you know. You, okay. Uh, where you've got a lot of volume in a vapour behind it. You know, you can't make light of it. It, it, it is, it is, it's a different, it, you've just, you've just got to rely on your training and, and O&M manuals, the, the equipment manufacturers, you know, uh, provide. Trapping liquid is a big no-no, but if everything's designed correctly, it should be very difficult to trap liquid. So, yeah, I don't want to make light of the safety issues because, you know, it, 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 you can't be blasé about it. But at the end of the day, all the information's there, the training's there, and, um, and it is the new normal. And, and when you think, when you stood in a plant room and you're not working on it, you've just got to think, well, everything in this plant room is designed to run at these pressures. You know, it's just the new normal. So, yeah, I think... Um, Again, it's about confidence. Once yeah. people have experienced it and think, oh, well, it isn't that bad, or yeah, that, we, we vented that compressor, no problem, and we wanted to change the oil reg or whatever. You know, it, it's, it's getting your hands on, getting, getting to grips with it, and, and you know, time, time on the tools with CO2 is, yeah. is, is, is the biggest learning that you'll ever, you'll ever need or have. You know, it's just doing it. Yeah, no, I think so too. The more experience you do, it's like anything. The more you do it, the easier it gets. The more you understand, the more you'll learn from different parallels of that uh, knowledge. So on your systems, we'll we'll talk about some of maybe just the refrigeration systems. What kind of solutions do you do? Do you just basic boosters? Do you do adiabatic cooling? Will you add parallel compression ejectors on your systems? Do you work with your customers to figure out what's going to be the best solution for their application and what are some of the solutions that you put on your systems? Yeah, I mean, the big ones, uh, especially at the moment, are heat recovery and uh, parallel compression. So heat recovery is, um, we're doing schemes now in, in, in the industrial refrigeration world where we're collecting heat for three sources. And really, we're only scratching the surface of what's actually available. Um, is um, heat for the underfloor mat for the freezer, you know, the under un, the, the mat under the cold store that stops the frost heave. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of schemes where we're heat recovering for that. Um, then we're, we're doing a lot of glycol defrost schemes where the ice on the coolers is melted through a through, uh, pump glycol system, getting away from electric defrost. It's a lot less complicated than hot gas as well. And that is fantastic for a few reasons. One of the, mainly because the coolers defrost in no time. Uh, and obviously it's incredibly energy efficient and it's relatively simple. Uh, and then the third form of heat is obviously hot water, preheating direct hot water for tap water. Um, so we've done a few schemes recently where all three of those have been, um, uh, you know, uh, have been implemented so, and then I think there's going to be a big opportunity in adding to process heat as well, particularly in the dairy industry for pasteurization and all sorts where um, heat recovery um, is going to be a massive opportunity in the refrigeration world. Um, never mind, you know, heat pumps, there's, there's big opportunities in, in heat recovery. And then parallel compression. <clears throat> So parallel compression is, was, was kind of first used in Italy and Spain and the south of France. Uh, it built as an energy saver um, for, for, for making CO2 more efficient in high ambience. Uh, I'm sure there's you know, quite a few parallel compression systems in, uh, in, in the southern states of America maybe Texas and Florida around there. But, um, and it is very good for making, um, uh, 
refrigeration to transcritical systems are more energy efficient. But where we found a big use for them in the UK is, um, is reducing the uh, electric supply. So say if we're asking for a thousand amps, uh, a thousand amps supply for one of our packs, if we're asking for 800, it makes a big difference. You know, we're locking somewhere between 60 to 20, uh, 16 to 20 percent off the required main size. Um, and um, that has big implications. You know, it's a, it, one, of the, one of the downsides of CO2 transcritical is it is very intensive on electric when you're running transcritical. Um, obviously, that isn't a, a year round thing because CO2 is very, very good in low ambience, much better than any refrigerant in harnessing free cooling in low ambience. So what it costs you in, in high ambience, you more than get back in low ambience. But ultimately, um, efficiency aside, reducing the mains capacity of a CO2 system is a big headline thing to do. And we've won jobs on, on the back of being able to do that. Um, and it's, it's tricky. There's quite a bit of design and experience that goes into making the parallel compressors run for longer than they need to, because they're only really designed to run for a few hours every summer. But if you get the, the, the sizing right of the compressors and really make them scale down in terms of their capacity, um, then you can use it for a lot more over the year and get the energy benefits. So not only are you getting the, the benefit of reducing the mains, uh, cable sizes and breaker sizes, but then you, you can get an energy payback if, you size it if you size the compressors correctly that's a key key thing i really like that you brought that up because when i first learned about the basic booster system and i learned this from andre patino from emerson you could have 10 compressors in the middle of the summer during transcript you they're running all but in low ambient you only need four or five of those compressors only and then you have that parallel compression compressor you don't need all those extra compressors and you say it's more less energy it, consumption and that that's big when you you know i don't always think about that but when you're taking a thousand amps and you're knocking it down to 800 amps holy man there's probably just a ton of saving just on that hardware going into that system by doing one solution that you know you custom design for your customer so i really liked hearing hearing that because this is the opportunity uh, with co2 because there are many options because a lot of people think oh it's big energy it costs you a pile more money all year round you know it's not a good idea but it does cost in certain times, certain applications, certain ambience. But when it's not that ambient, there's a huge amount of savings that to be had. I like that. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's, there's obviously um, parallel compression and the heat recovery. And then obviously ejectors are really kind of uh, the new hot topic. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're kind of working with those in, in a few on a few projects. But um, it's quite a complicated world, the world of ejectors. Um, and also, um, I've forgotten what they're called now. Um, it'll come back to me in a bit, but yeah, the ejectors is different configurations, whether they're recovering on the low side or the high side, uh, and on what you're in training into the ejector, there's a lot of configurations, a lot of work going on. Um, and, uh, the, there's, there's big benefits, but that then, um, is, is another layer when I've talked about CO2 transcritical refrigeration being different in the receiver and the gas cooler, and you can pretty much isolate it to, the, to those areas. When you start talking about parallel compression and ejectors, and you know, you're adding, you're adding layers of complexity that, you know, that, that comes with time. You've just got to work with them and learn about them, but ultimately, um, there's some big advantages there potentially yeah and i i see that that's going to be that's going to be easy in a few years because i see a lot more systems going that direction once again you learn about it the technology continues to grow and the more you see it the easier it gets it is complex a lot of it right now but over time it won't be as complex i want to get back to something that you said that you put in your system because here in canada when i did supermarket work we only use really hot gas there was some electrical and i know when i talk with james and a lot of other people from the uk you guys use most electrical for defrost 
but you're using pump glycol for defrost. I'd like you to expand on that and how you have that set up in your system because I think that's an interesting concept because you say it defrosts very quickly and is that compared to electric defrost, hot gas defrost? And uh, I'd love to hear some more points on that because that's something that we I don't really do. I've seen it before, but I haven't worked on it much. Yeah, I mean, we, it's really warm glycol. So yeah. we're... we're um, we we heat a tank with heat recovery. So our plate heat exchange on the discharge, heat a, a buffer tank of, of glycol, excuse me, up until about 55, 60 degrees. But then we mix it to say 25 degrees C. So I'm not sure what that relates to in Fahrenheit, but it's cold to the touch because obviously our skin's at 35, 36, 37. Mm -hmm. And when we say warm glycol, defrosting with warm glycol it's colder than you touch so it doesn't feel warm but it yeah. com compared to the coolers inside the room yeah. it's it, it's very warm so it once you start pumping that through the, the coolers on a separate circuit so the, the the coolers or the evaporators are dual circuit you've got a co2 circuit and then you've got the glycol circuit the glycol's there to stop the uh, the, the, the fluid freezing obviously um uh, when the pump's not running. Uh, so the great benefit of that is, is that it's very soft on the coolers because you can introduce it at, say, wh wh whatever temperature you want and slowly build it up. Uh, well, when I say slowly, so you don't get that thermal shock all yeah. at once. And uh, with hot gas defrost, that's what you've got to be very careful of. Um, and then it's quite difficult because you know, on CO2 systems, you're piping out high pressure pipe work to the coolers because obviously it's either saturated gas off the receiver or a, a cooled gas off the discharge from the compressors. But either way, you're piping high pressure pipe work out to the coolers and then you've got to be able to get the liquid back to the receiver. And it's, it's quite complicated to engineer, quite complicated to control, quite expensive to install because you've got high pressure pipe work. So the UK uh, is pretty much going down a, a warm glycol route for, bit for big cooler defrost in distribution centres, food logistics and, uh, and food production is, is, is warm glycol's gathering pace because it's simpler, it's lower pressure pipe work, it's just pumps and effectively water technology, hydronics, mm -hmm. um, and... Um, and it works, it works very, very well and very efficiently. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's, it's something. So you can have your warm glycol for the coolers, but you, from the same buffer tank, you can do other things like heat the under, store, uh, the under uh, floor of the cold store with the same glycol potentially. And, and you can then have, you've also got automatically double separation for heating water. So you're not, you know, because in, in, in the EU, we can't, just run CO2 through a hot water tank because you could potentially contaminate the tank with oil if the tank splits. So you've got to kind of double segregate. So if you've got the glycol circuit running for warm glycol and you're under, under cold store heating, then you've already got your segregation for heating hot water as well. So there's a lot of benefits to it. And um, yeah, we, we've engineered some great systems using it because we don't just do... Uh, co2 racks and packs we we help our customers you know one of the things that i thought about was right we want to take co2 into the industrial area but not many industrial contractors knew about it or wanted to know about it so we we've kind of said well to help co2 grow in the uk in the industrial sector we've got to help the contractors so we help them with pipe work design pressure equipment directive and compliance with legislation on pressure uh, and we do all our system design and if that includes heat recovery we can do we've got a department that can can help them with system design and so we will design the glycol system for them as well you know so yeah and glycol defrost is a is a, a big thing now yeah and i like that that you're using it for a multiple purpose not only for the defrost and it's under floor it's for preheating a bit of the water potentially or so and that's smart now you're building like a full solution for your, your customer, not just doing an add-on. You're making it work in all parts of the system. 
And, and I do really like that. And for anyone listening that is in the supermarket space and worked on cool gas defrost, it s- sounds similar to that because that's where you would take um, the gas off the, the receiver and you would just put it through the, um, the coil. And it's not the, what you said, you don't have that thermal shock on the coil compared to that hot gas defrost. Yeah, I mean, we call, or I call that sat gas, saturated gas off ah. the top of the receiver. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that cool gas, sat gas. What? Yeah, uh, the problem is with with it. You've got you are piping another kind of higher pressure pipe out to each evaporator. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad system, but we we're just finding, particularly in non retail space, that the glycol defrost is is uh, is a less complicated solution. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's really good because. When you first see CO2, it, it seemed very com- It is complicated, but the more you see it do it, it gets easier. I love that. I love that. So, what are what what's next uh, for you and your company, and where do you see CO2 going? Because we we talked about where it started for you, just being curious, and you continue to grow from your consulting business right up into where you got a large manufacturing business with customers um, in the refrigerate, CO2 refrigeration space and in the heat pump space, and you see the market is growing, where, where do you guys see, where do you see your company going as well as CO2? Well, it's just, uh, you know, we've, we've had several years of product development now. So we've, I'm learning about componentry and, and learning from, you know, you, you always learn from your mistakes. So not that we've made many, and, uh, but ultimately, we've gone through many years now of learning our trade. And now's the time for us to kind of scale that business now and, and, and build customers. So I'm not saying there's no, we, we haven't got anything out left to learn uh, on our CO2 journey because that would be very kind of, uh, you know, it wouldn't be, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be right. But ultimately, you know, we're more than 90% there. And, um, you know, so now we need to concentrate on scaling the business and, and maybe looking at new markets elsewhere outside the UK or, you know, uh, leveraging more markets within the UK in the heating sector. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity out there for, for working with CO2. So, yeah, it, it's, it's more of a, a scaling. It, it's become, it's going to become less of a technical kind of development. Um, and more scaling. But when I say that, I'm always talking about developments of, you know, of, of different technologies. Yeah. I know so- for sure behind the scenes, there's lots of stuff going on. You already yeah, said well, high pressure ejectors, low pressure ejectors, you know, yeah. I'm sure you're thinking about adiabatic cooling and all these other new valves, like uh, mechanical valves coming out for the evaporator. Like there's so much new technology that's going to be coming out too. It's, I know in yeah, the background, so- there's lots going on. <laughs> yeah, so- Software development's a big one for us and, uh, you know, making heat pumps more efficient. You know, that's where our development's going to come from, I think. And, uh, yeah, I've, actually, I'm lying. I have got a lot of aspirations. On <laughs> but really, I'm, as a businessman, I've got to try and start concentrating on scaling what we already know because, of, we, you know, we keep, we keep kind of developing new products and yeah. uh, now's the time to start, um, to start scaling them. Yeah, I love that. And so I, I like something you said a little bit earlier, and, and I think this is where a lot of manufacturers that do it well excel. And that's where you said training and support, supporting your customers. And I see it more and more when I, when I talk to different technicians or engineers around the globe, and I hear a different tone in their voice when they work with a manufacturer that supports them 100% and trains them. Let's talk a little bit about that on what you do to offer training for your customers. Do you train both their contractor? Because a lot of times you would be working for the end user or half and half or a bit for the contractor and end user. I'm not sure your model, but- Mainly for the mainly for contractors. Okay. Um, whether that model works, it transfers into the heat pump market, I don't know, but certainly in the refrigeration, the contractors are our customers. Okay. And we offer commissioning services. In fact, we don't we we won't sell a plant unless we can be involved in commissioning it. And you know, we always like to make sure there's a lot of people that are willing to learn and want to learn. And and you know, when we are commissioning it, making sure that 
those those uh, skills and, uh, and and knowledge are, are transferred certainly to a, at the very minimum one person within that contracting business ideally two or three and that's that's happened for us you know we are we are making we have got those relationships but i think it's important at this stage to say that you know the world that we're in uh, and our industry the refrigeration industry has um, got some fantastic opportunities massive opportunities in in the next few years and not few really for as long as i can see because refrigeration equipment is a huge consumer of energy and um with energy prices increasing i don't know what they're like in 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 america at the moment and canada but in the e in, in europe and and the eu uh, and the uk the energy prices are just absolutely spiraling um for many reasons the ukraine war is one of them but um you know there's there's uh the, the energy price is just going bonkers so there's huge opportunity for people in our world and our industry to to learn and specialize in reducing energy efficiency and then also in the heat pump world because the decarbonization heat agenda is not going to go away and um burning gas and oil to create heat um will is becoming antisocial in the uk very you know it's really it's you know it's off the hook at the moment and uh, and i can only see that moving across the atlantic so the opportunity for businesses to create training schools and the opportunities for people within our industry are phenomenal at the moment and you know for those people that want a really good career and want to have a, a fantastic career for the for the foreseeable future and, and, and earn good money and, and have a great career. Uh, I, I can't think of a better industry to be in at the moment. I 100% agree. I, I preach like that, all, I preach like that the, the choir all the time. Like, uh, and all the people that follow me and, and are on this um, a call now and on my podcast, they, they totally they get it. Refrigeration is, is the industry you wanna be in. It's uh, yeah. something that I didn't even know about at first. Like I, I got into refrigeration just by chance, but now I, I realize the, the advantage of having this skill and meeting amazing guests just like yourself. And, and you, you even saying it yourself, people all around the world talking the same talk as me is like refrigeration is where you want to be because there's just so much opportunity globally and it's not going to slow down. The more no. the world turns, the more refrigeration the world's going to need. And like you said, there's a huge influx of reducing that energy because the costs, costs are going to continue to go up and, and that we need more people in our industry. And, and CO2 is one of the, ref, the, the refrigerators that's going to make like, the biggest difference. And I know it just because it, for me, I can see technicians starting to learn how to do refrigeration. I shouldn't say the right way, but they're more, they take their time to do CO2 than they did HFC refrigerants yeah. they, they they pull the, they're pulling better proper evacuation and maybe it's just the culture that we're starting to turn you need to purge nitrogen but i know when i started out there was not purging nitrogen wasn't happening in the pipe when i was brazen you know because i didn't know nobody told me and maybe it's because we're more talking there's more knowledge out there but on co2 people are a little wary but they're they're being more cautious they're being more curious and they're doing the job the way they should always been doing it but learning along the way and it helps yeah. with manufacturers supporting them, training them, giving them advice, and I love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah. And I, but I think there's there's there is opportunities for businesses to create training schools. That you know, we it can't just be down to the manufacturers to train. You know, the universities are surely going to uh, have a role to play, and the schools, the HVAC schools. You know, th there is going to be a massive shortage of skills in our industry to to deliver what our industry will be delivering in five, 10, 15 years time, because it's just going to grow exponentially. And, you know, it, it creates an opportunity um, for everybody involved, but it also creates challenges for our industry. So, yeah, yeah. it's exciting times, 
but um, really, I think um, you know, it, if if people have aspirations, entrepreneurial or career, you know, te- you know, technical technical aspirations to become, you know, a thought leader or good at engineering, the opportunities are there. Yeah, I, I love it, and I totally agree with you, Daniel. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with me. Where can people uh, get a in connection with you? If it's on LinkedIn, if it's on your website, where can people find out more about you and your company? Yeah, LinkedIn, uh, our website, iCentra.net. Um, I'm not I'm not great on social media because I'm too busy. I do I do need to take more time to you know um, to get into that environment. But um, yeah, I mean I'm I'm always contactable through LinkedIn. Um, and uh, and the web um so yeah just if anybody wants to get in touch probably linkedin's the best route and uh, i'm sure if, if they contact yourself trevor um you you can you can put them in touch with oh, me for sure um so yeah thanks thanks for having me on